Hey guys, um, so let's talk about chemotherapy and radiation side effects. And this had to be its own PowerPoint because there is a lot of them. There's a whole huge, like, I think there's two tables. It's like a continued table because it's so long in your book. And again, this PowerPoint is for complex students about cancer, not for adult students. So if you're an adult student watching this, turn this off and go spend your time reading or doing something that you actually need to know at this level. You can come back and watch this video later. I promise it will be here. So um, effects of chemotherapy and other cancer treatments are systemic. They're very hard on the body. They have effects head to toe. So they affect every um, you know, area of the body. Everyone's going to react differently. So you need to be looking for the variety of things that can happen. Some symptoms are gonna be just uncomfortable and some can lead to some serious complications. And I'll have a different PowerPoint that's just gonna be over cancer um, emergencies that you can also look at. So let's talk about the head. Let's start with the head, cognitive changes. So some things that can happen is what's called, one thing that's um, you know fairly common that can happen is what's called chemo brain. Um, uh, patients with chemo brain can have issues with concentration or memory. Um, so how we can help them with this is we can you know um, encourage them to have a daily planner, um, adequate sleep rest cycle, and some brain training like doing um, games, puzzles, and things to simulate their brain. Um, keep in mind a lot of therapeutic communication and psychosocial support is important here too um, because for a patient that maybe um, you know, has a lot of mental faculties prior to their treatment um, and that having that decline it can be very emotionally frustrating. Um, we also want to uh, consider the fact that um, these, tr yeah, these treatments can cause increased ICP. So we need to monitor their neurostatus closely. I know you all remember all this fun stuff, hopefully still from this unit. Um, they also may need corticosteroids to help reduce some of the edema from the increased ICP. Uh, the, another neurological change can be um, paresthesias, like numbness and tingling in their extremities. So they may need gabapentin, or sometimes we even have to reduce their treatment if it's causing really significant paresthesias. So for the hearts and the lung, um, they can have inflammation of the lung, what's called a pneumonitis. Um, they can have fibrosis of the lung, which can happen over time, especially with radiation to the chest. It can kind of harden that area. Um, and so for these patients, I wanna do pulmonary rehab and teach them breathing exercises to kind of support that. Um, it can be, these medications can be toxic to the heart, the poor, beautiful heart, cause dysrhythmias and things like that. So I wanna treat those dysrhythmias and monitor their EKG closely. Um, there also can be inflammation of the heart, like a pericarditis or a myocarditis. And if you remember back to your favorite section, which is cardiac, um, you'll remember, um, you know, for these, you know, we just want to treat them accordingly, uh, monitor for signs and symptoms of these. So just kind of thinking back to some of those um, other symptoms from early on, back when life was easy and cardiac, um, you know, uh, that can show up. So there's a lot of gastrointestinal com uh, complications. They can have lack of appetite or weight loss. Um, and for those patients, you know, I want to monitor their weight closely, small frequent meals. I might even give them appetite stimulants if they're really struggling to really have appetite to eat anything. Um, they can on the, uh, have some bowel issues like constipation. So um, some, uh, some of these medications are going to cause constipation. Some are going to cause diarrhea. So if it's causing constipation, I want to increase, encourage a high fiber diet, increased activity, stool softeners, increased fluids, things like that. Um, for diarrhea, on the opposite end of the spectrum, again, usually they're not going to cause both, but it's going to be one or the other. If they're having diarrhea, I might give anti-diarrheal meds, especially if it's starting to break down their skin. Um, but, you know, first and foremost, maybe a low fiber, low residue diet. And um, remember, the problem in diarrhea is not just their skin, you know, breakdown and that it's uncomfortable. It's that they're losing a lot of fluid. So I want to make sure to replace those fluid losses so they don't get dehydrated. Um, then they can have liver failure. So I want to monitor their laboratory levels closely and treat if it occurs. Because remember, um, you always have to think about your filters, your liver and your kidneys are your filters. And so these medications can always be a little bit harder on your filters. Um, and then nausea and vomiting um, is one of the probably most common side effects. So we usually give prophylactic antiemetics and we encourage them to eat and drink when they're not feeling symptoms. So for the GU and reproductive problems, they can have kind of like I was mentioning before with the liver, they can also have nephrotoxicity. So I want to monitor their kidney function levels and avoid other things that are going to irritate the kidneys. And remember, what do the kidneys love? They love fluid. They have to be supported um, and have enough fluid. So definitely um, want to um, 
you know, support the kidneys and having good kidney health. They can also have what's called hemorrhagic cystitis, which is like a bleeding um, bladder infection. Um, with these patients, I want to increase their fluid intake, um, monitor for signs of that infection and give really supportive care through that. Um, and, um, and I should say it's an infection, but it's a, um, it's an inflammation, excuse me. Um, then they also, of course, with reproductive problems, they can have infertility. So I want to talk about, um, before they even get into their cancer treatments, if they're young and in their fertile ages, talk about what are they, uh, where are they at with kids? Do they want to have kids or more kids? Um, and they might consider options like, um, putting their sperm or their eggs into a bank, um, you know, to, um, keep them safe in case after their treatment, they recover and they want to try to get pregnant after that, they have some viable, um, you know, um, uh, reproductive. Uh, organs and um, materials that they need to have that child. Um, so definitely kind of going in, considering that even prior to treatment. Uh, we also uh, have blood and biochemical problems. So we can have, you know, the, the three top side effects that you really hear about a lot of these, what we call blood dyscrasias, might be dyscrasias, I never pronounce things very well. But, um, you know, it's um, anemia, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. So low of everything, low red blood cells, low white blood cells, which is what we kind of lead to what we call about neutropenia. And then they can also have low platelets. Um, so for anemia, we want to monitor their hemoglobin and hematocrit. Um, we might give them iron supplements or um, erythropoietin. And then I want to support their nutrition um, as they uh, may have some nutritional deficiencies that are adding to that anemia. Um, for the low white blood cells or leukopenia, um, leukopenia is um, classified as a white blood cell count less than 4,000, whereas a neutropenia is a white blood cell count less than 1,000. Um, so for these patients, they're going to be high risk for infection. So I want to monitor their temperature. I'm going to teach them to avoid crowds and those with infection. And if they are neutropenic, I'm going to give them teaching on that. And I have that on another slide. Um, they also can have hyperuricemia or high, high uric acid levels. So I want to monitor those levels. If they are high, I can give things like kind of like almost like treating gout, like the allopurinol, and also increase their fluid intake to dilute that excess uric acid. So neutropenic precautions includes, you know, frequent hand washing. Um, they should notify their doctor if there's any symptoms of infection, which would be like a temperature greater than 104. Um, they should avoid crowds or people with infection, avoid undercooked or not, not undercooked, uncooked meats and unwashed fruits and veggies. So when people come and visit, they should not be bringing um, uh, what do you call it? Um, any sort of fresh fruit baskets or anything like that on their trays. It's actually going to say if it is, if they're on neutropenic precautions on their food tray, they're not going to be given any fresh fruits or vegetables um, and anything that's uncooked because that can put them at high risk for getting bacterial infection. Uh, we want to protect their skin and perform hygiene daily. So they need to keep themselves very clean, use a soft toothbrush, um, and then uh, no gardening or cleaning up after pets anywhere that might have bacteria. And that goes also with the fresh fruit. They can't have fresh flowers in their room either. There's also skin complications. So there's alopecia, which is hair loss. And this is probably one of the most common things people think of with cancer treatments. So they can, um, uh, if they have really long hair, they can get it cut off early. They can have their head shaved early and get fitted for this. Um, and uh, effectively, you know, the big goals are just going to be if they do want to keep their hair until it falls out, um, you know, try to avoid damage um, or excessive care, like overwashing and things like that. And just a lot of emotional and psychosocial report, um, uh, psychosocial social support. That is, um, you know, a lot of patients for them, their hair is like who they are and it defines them. And it's really hard to imagine a life without um, their hair. So um, we definitely want to uh, try to support them in emotionally and let them know what their resources are and support groups that there are, because especially for women, um, it can definitely be a defining factor for um, what they measure as their own beauty. Um, they can also have what are called eruptions or erythema. Um, and so like, you know, got a lot of skin changes and stuff like that from the cancer treatments. And so lotions and creams can help with that. Um, and then they can be photosensitive or really sensitive to the sun. So um, in that case, we'd want them to avoid sun exposure if they are having that. 
um, other re reactions that patients can have, what's called stomatitis or mucositis or esophagitis. So all of these, um, you know, are going to be inflammations, um, you know, in the mouth, in the throat, the mucosa or the esophagus. Um, we need to do frequent assessments on these patients. Obviously, um, having sores and things and this inflammation in these areas can um, affect their nutrition. So I want to support nutrition and they should avoid things that are irritating or spicy. So like doing a moist, bland, soft diet is going to be one of their best options. We we'll also want to do oral rinses to help, um, you know, clean out that area. <coughs> Excuse me. And then topical analgesics um, to help with some of the pain of that. Um, for fatigue, we're going to teach them energy conservation techniques um, and moderate exercise as tolerated um, to help manage a lot of that fatigue. So that's it. I know that's a lot. There is a lot of side effects. And like I mentioned, there's um, so many ways that chemotherapy and radiation and other cancer treatments can affect the body. So it's definitely helpful to kind of know some of these things to look out for so that you can um, make the experience, you know, as this is a, a very hard experience, but make it as um, manageable for a patient as possible and be there to support them. So yeah, I'll see you on the next one.